Good morning to you all, and thank you for coming along to support our summer scholars this morning. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on this morning, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. My name is Tom Rogers. I'm a historian here at the Military History Section in the Australian War Memorial. Since 1985, the Military History Section of the Australian War Memorial has hosted uh, 103 young, summer, young historians under the Summer Scholars Scheme, providing them with practical experience of working in a major historical institution, working alongside public historians uh, and working alongside museum professionals. Each scholar is paired up with a, a supervisor, or this year with two supervisors, um, from the Military History Section. I'd like to thank all of the staff who've helped out this year from all the different sections in the memorial. Uh, it's been a really great program this year. One of the big things, the exciting things for this year's program is that we are streaming it live as a webinar, as you probably know. We haven't done that before, so uh, we'll be, one of the big things that allows us to do is to take questions at the end uh, from people who are watching at home. So I'd like to say welcome to everyone who's watching at home. The key difference between our Summer Scholars Program at the War Memorial and other similar pro programs around Canberra uh, is that when our scholars arrive, we give them a project to carry out. So that means what you're hearing today, the, the research that you're hearing today has been carried out over the last six weeks from scholars who in generally didn't know much about the topic that they were looking at. So I think you'll agree with me that that makes their final uh, presentations that much more impressive. This morning's program of events, I'm going to introduce our two scholars. Uh, I'm going to ask them to come up. They're going to speak for 20 minutes. At the end of each talk, we're going to have 10 minutes for question time. Um, when it is time for questions, I ask you to come up to the microphones. We are not allowed to handle the microphones because of COVID. Um, and so I'd ask you to come up to the microphones. Don't touch the microphone, don't touch the stand, just speak into it. Uh, and we will capture your question for uh, those following along at home. Our first speaker this morning is Rose Dreisek, whose project I supervised with Mick Kelly, also from the military history section. Rose has been a fantastic student to work with. She came in bright and ready and full of ideas uh, at the beginning of January to learn about the Korean War uh, and specifically about uh, one RAR uh, and their um, experiences throughout the war. Uh, Rose has come to this, it's, a, it's an understudied uh, period as she's going to tell you in Australia's military history um, and she's really turned out an amazing project. So can we please welcome Rose Dreisek. Thanks Tom, that's a very nice introduction. So as I began my research, I noticed that there were many accounts of the soldiers of the 1st Battalion, or 1RAR, uh, coping well with the difficult conditions that they faced in Korea. So the aim of my research became to uncover what factors helped them cope during their time in the line. Hmm, is the slides not working? I can... Sorry. Uh, but let's start a little bit earlier. What was the Korean War and how did it fit into the bigger context of the Cold War? So the Korean War took place between 1950 and 1953 and it happened as the Cold War divisions between communism and capitalism, the Soviet Union and the United States really started to solidify. Korea is seen as a proxy war of the Cold War with the Soviets and Chinese supporting North Korea and the United Nations including the US, the UK and Australia supporting the South Koreans. In the aftermath of the Second World War, Korea was divided along the 38th parallel. North Korea became communist, while the capitalist South was supported by the US. On the 25th of June, 1950, the communist North invaded the South, and UN forces later joined in support of the South. Later, China joined the war in support of the North, and it was mainly Chinese troops that won RAR faced while they were in Korea. 
The Soviet Union was also involved in the war, supplying weapons to North Korea. The early part of the war was characterised by a lot of back and forth movement as each side tried to push their opposition back. There were also major battles during this period, including Kapiong in April 1951 and Mariang San in October 1951. And the 3rd Battalion uh, uh, of the Royal Australian Regiment, or 3 RAR, were involved in these big battles because they'd been part of the occupying forces in Japan and were moved over. The war then settled into a static phase for the last year and a half or so of the war. And this was very much like the First World War trenches on the Western Front. Uh, often the two sides were only a few hundred metres apart with the no man's land in between. The main type of combat during this period was patrols into no man's land with occasional raids on enemy positions. But the lines didn't really change very much and there was very limited movement. The patrols were designed to put pressure on their opposition in the ongoing truce negotiations, as well as to capture prisoners and destroy enemy defences. A truce was finally agreed in July 1953, and both sides withdrew two kilometres. The area in between is what we know as the demilitarised zone today, and it's still there. Uh, and the Korean War actually never ended because there was never a formal peace agreement. And you can still see the ongoing tensions between North and South Korea today. So what was 1RER's role in all of this? The battalion was in Korea during the static part of the war, arriving in April 1952 and staying for about 12 months. The Australian soldiers, it's important to note, were all volunteers, either with the regular army or with K-Force, which was specially created for the Korean War and included a lot of Second World War veterans. Once they were in Korea, 1RER joined the 28th British Commonwealth Infantry Brigade, which also included 3RER and several British units. The brigade was within the 1st Commonwealth Division. One RAR spent most of its time in the front line undertaking patrols and improving defences. It was involved in two major raids, Operation Blaze in July 1952 and Operation Fauna in December of 1952, both of which happened just to the south of Mariang San. Both of these also failed in their aim to capture prisoners, but they were able to cause damage to enemy positions. One RAR is really overlooked in the scholarship on Korea, and what has been written about it focuses on these two major operations. One RAR is often also overshadowed by three RAR because they were involved in the bigger battles of Mariang Sang and Kapiong. Uh, in addition, two RAR, which replaced one RAR, often also gets more attention, as it was involved in the last part of the war on the hook, where the Chinese launched a major offensive right before the truce. So the aim of this presentation is to look more closely at the experiences of 1RAR and what it was like to be in Korea during the static phase of the war. By the time it returned to Australia, the battalion had lost 43 men and a further 166 were wounded. So what were their everyday experiences like in the line? Firstly, 1RAR faced very difficult conditions. There was really heavy snow and freezing cold in the winter. It could get down below minus 24 degrees Celsius. There was also very hilly terrain, and it was very bare by this point. Apart from being an everyday problem, this also caused operational issues. For example, with Operation Fauna, the soldiers had to come back up the frozen hill. Keith Payne, who later won a Victoria Cross in Vietnam, described this as being like an ice rink, as the men tried to get footholds in the ice, and many got torn hands from trying to grab at the wire. It was also very hot in the summer. Summing it up, Keith Payne said, Korea would be the war with the worst climactic conditions, the worst conditions, anti-human comfort that a soldier could ever put up with. While they were in the line, uh, the soldiers lived in bunkers or dugouts or hoochies as they were known. Payne described these as being about 10 foot long, about six feet, feet deep, and having about four and a half feet of overhead protection, often things like sandbags. They lived in these with two others, and they were often accompanied by rats, just like in the First World War. These bunkers could also be very dangerous. With the heavy rains of July 1952, 58 bunkers collapsed, and a further 26 were condemned as unsafe. Private Edward Charles Kendrick was killed when his bunker collapsed while he was asleep. During their time in the line, members of 1RAR undertook patrol every night, although it's important to note that individuals more likely went out every week or two. There were multiple different types of patrol, including fighting, ambush, standing, reconnaissance, snatch patrols to try and get prisoners, and layup patrols. 
The layout patrols are maybe one of the most dangerous because they involve trying to sneak behind the enemy line and stay there for 12 hours up to a few days trying to gain intelligence, and then they had to get back. It's also important to remember that the Chinese were also out in no man's land, so often the two uh, sides encountered each other, and this often led to firefights and could lead to really heavy casualties as well. It was also really easy to feel frustrated by the static nature of the war. They weren't making a lot of progress, there was very little movement, and even with the heavy patrolling and occasional raids, nothing really changed that much. As Lieutenant Douglas Yates later wrote, weeks of constant patrol duty became a weary business, as men spent tense hours exposed and vulnerable without seemingly achieving any results. Another aspect of trench warfare was the constant mortar and shell fire. Robert O'Neill, the official historian of the Korean War, wrote that between June 1952 and February 1953, which, 1953, sorry, which covers most of one RIR's period, an average of 125 enemy shells and 66 mortar bombs fell on the 28th Brigade each day. During a particularly heavy period in November 1952, in one 24-hour period, one RAR recorded 28 shells, 123 mortar bombs, and 296 unspecified projectiles landing in battalion areas. This could take a real toll on the soldiers. Private Des Gilfoyle later recalled that, boy, it was mighty hard on the nerves, adding that they were all close to breaking during these periods of heavy fire. So the members of one RIR were in constant danger while they were in the line, and even while they were in reserve positions, they were still within range of the artillery. They were always aware of this, and for a lot of them, it just became part of life. For example, Lance Corporal Henry Rickson later recalled finding a hand while he was cooking baked beans. He said that he just looked at it, put more dirt on it and patted it down, and just kept cooking his baked beans. He added that this is how hard and callous he had become in order to deal with the circumstances. When not out on patrol, soldiers of 1 RAR were working on improving their defences, particularly work working on the barbed wire. Their defences on forward locations were made up of barbed wire and minefields. Things definitely didn't always go to plan. For example, Captain Philip Greville and Private Dennis Condon were captured in August 1952 after they were sent out to fix a minefield fence. Everything went wrong. It ended up taking longer than they'd anticipated, uh, their radio stopped working and they had to go back the same way that they'd come and they ended up being amb ambushed by the Chinese and taken prisoner. They were kept prisoner for about a year until August 1953 and they suffered very harsh treatment during this time. The aim of many patrols and raids was to capture a prisoner. However, the only time that one RAR actually got a prisoner on the night of the 13th of September 1952, it was by accident. It happened during a fighting patrol uh, when Lance Corporal David McCarthy came across a Chinese soldier during a firefight and seized him. But the prisoner didn't actually know very much. Gavin Toby Ralston described him as looking about 15. This really shows the human side of the war, as it wasn't often that the two sides actually came face to face. The Chinese were more often an unseen enemy that they just knew had huge numbers behind them. This incident also demonstrates the futility of the constant quest to capture prisoners, as low-level Chinese soldiers often had relatively little information to provide. Minefields were also a major part of life in the line. When they went out on patrol, the soldiers went through gaps in the wire and around minefields. This meant that when they arrived at a new location, they had to do a lot of reconnaissance patrols so that everyone could navigate at night. Sometimes, however, minefields were unmarked or simply unrecorded. There were numerous minefield accidents. On the night of the 7th of November, a patrol led by Lieutenant William Digger James accidentally entered an unmarked minefield. One man was killed and a further four were wounded. James himself had serious injuries to his legs, including the loss of one foot, but he still oversaw the evacuation of casualties and insisted on being the last one evacuated. He was awarded the Military Cross later that month and later served as Senior Medical Officer in Vietnam and as Chairman of the War Memorial Council. This painting of a one RAR dugout by war artist Ivor Heel really captures the intensity of life in the line. And this painting is on display in the galleries. So how did they cope with these pressures? The unit really benefited from having effective leadership. 
Australia's military leaders were protected by an Australian government directive that they could appeal decisions made by other countries. While this was never acted upon, it was really important leverage in how Australia dealt with its allies. One RIR's leaders also resisted taking the pressure to undertake unwise actions. There was a real emphasis on not taking lives unnecessarily. For example, Brigadier Thomas Daly, who was in charge of the 28th Brigade, resisted pressure to capture more prisoners. Given that one RIR had only managed to capture one prisoner in its whole time in the line, this kind of pressure, if it had been followed through, would have meant sending out even more patrols, which would likely have been unsuccessful and just led to even more casualties. Adjutant Eric Smith also recounted how Ian Hutchison, who was the commanding officer of one RIR, resisted pressure from Brigadier John MacDonald, who was at the time commander of the 20th Brigade, to undertake a battalion-sized raid when they first arrived in Korea. Because of Hutchison's resistance, this became a company raid instead, which was Operation Blaze in July 1952. There are also stories of one RIR leaders having a good sense of humour and their general good, good treatment of their troops. For example, Henry Rickson recalled how he had heard that when British soldiers were in a bar on leave in Japan, they would have to leave if an officer arrived. But when Rickson and his friends ran into company commander A.S. Mann when they were in Japan, he bought them all a drink. Mann also didn't punish Rickson for refusing to, to dig latrines as he was ordered to by another officer. This really added to the respect that people like Rickson felt for their leadership. Rickson had said that they would have followed Mann to hell and back. While this kind of experience was not necessarily universal, it does show that leadership could be relatively informal and relaxed, and that this could really strengthen the respect that the men felt for their leaders. The leadership had also learned the lessons of previous conflicts and the early part of the war in Korea. For example, they were pretty well equipped by this point. You can see these mesh inner soles, which belong to Gavin Toby Ralston, allowed air to circulate so that sweat didn't freeze and cause frostbite. The 28th Brigade also rotated regularly with other brigades in the division, uh, so they weren't always in the line. The general principle for the division was having three brigades up and one in reserve, with about 14 weeks in the line and then about seven in reserve. There were also very generous leave arrangements. Members of 1RIR got five days leave in Japan after four months and 21 days after eight months. This meant that they really knew that they would get a significant break and they always had something to look forward to. Camaraderie and pride were also important in helping the soldiers to cope. For example, one RIR operated on a rotational system. While members of three RIR were replaced individually when their time was up, one RIR was sent over as a unit for a year. This meant that most of its members had trained together. They went to Korea together, spent the rotation together, and then left together. This enabled them to build really strong friendships. And it also meant that there was an, a defined end date when they all knew that they would be going home. Members of 1RIR also bonded by comparing themselves to others, especially the British and Canadians with whom they served in the division. The Canadians especially were notorious for leaving a position in poor condition. For example, when the Royal Canadian Regiment handed over Hill 355, also known as Little Gibraltar, to 1RIR in November 1952, the Canadian unit said that it was handing over the position complete, slightly worse for wear and tear, but otherwise defendable. However, 1RIR commanding officer Morris Bunny Austin, who took over from Hutchinson in November 1952, said that it was a barely organised rubbish heap and that the Canadians had simply chucked everything over the fence in front of their positions. So throughout November, 1RAI ended up having to undertake lots of work in repairing their defences and there were a number of minefield incidents as they were poorly marked or totally unrecorded. The Canadians also hadn't kept up strong patrols, so the Chinese patrols were able to come right up to their wire with little resistance. Uh, so, in order to address this, 1RIR undertook a really heavy patrolling program, which some people thought afterwards might have prevented a major offensive or a bigger action by the Chinese. So, 1RIR were able to feel a real sense of pride in that they were exerting some control over no man's land. Humour and comforts were also significant in helping the soldiers cope, and I'm going to focus on Christmas 1952 as a good example of this. In September, the battalion organised for Assistant Adjutant Douglas Yates to go to Japan to buy a bulk purchase of gifts that soldiers would be able to buy and send home. At Christmas the previous year, the Chinese soldiers had left propaganda and gifts on the wire of their enemies. 
So, in the days leading up to Christmas of 1952, one RAR sent out special fighting and snatch patrols to ambush the Chinese Xmas cheer patrols, as they were called in the unit war diary. But despite these efforts, the Chinese propaganda and gifts appeared on the minefield fences on the night of the 23rd of December. These included banners, cards, small bags with gifts. Various eyewitnesses also described watches, cigarettes, sweets, and safe conduct passes to encourage defection. This banner was one of those found at the time, and it's on display in the galleries as well. While the propaganda may have attempted to convince the Australians that they were fighting an American war and to remind them of their families back home, instead the propaganda was seen as entertaining. As the war diary noted, the propaganda left on Christmas had greater souvenir value to our men than any noticeable psychological effect. This was certainly not the only attempt of the Chinese to influence the views of one RAR soldiers. There were broadcasts of messages and popular music relatively commonly, along with other leaflets left throughout the year. Private Fred Roberts recalled that it was so overdone that it became a source of great amusement and entertainment. After all, he said, they didn't have gramophones and records, and it was nice to hear the current hit songs from back home. The commanding officer of 1RAR also received a Christmas gift from Lieutenant Colonel E. Amy, General Staff Officer for the Division. It was a portrait of Marilyn Monroe. The unit war diary noted that the portrait of Miss Monroe serves to remind them that the desire which her lovely form engenders in many masculine minds is equaled, if not exceeded, by the desire of members of this unit to capture a prisoner on one of our many raids designed for that, for that purpose. This highlights how, even though the lack of success could be frustrating, and doing the same thing day after day could get wearing, they were able to find humour in their situation and it helped them cope. One RAR were relieved by three RAR a few days after Christmas, and they were able to have Christmas celebrations in the reserve position. This included parcels from the RSL and the Melbourne Sun, as well as a big Christmas dinner. Even Santa Claus was able to visit the battalion. One RAR departed for Australia aboard the New Australia in March 1953 after a series of farewell parties and ceremonies and a visit to the UN War Cemetery in Busan. The battalion returned in 1954 as part of the peacekeeping forces overseeing the truce in Korea. So while one RAR faced really tough conditions on a daily basis, from the constant mortar and shell fire to the risk of minefield accidents and the frustrations of static warfare, the soldiers were able to cope with these conditions through a combination of strong leadership, a shared sense of camaraderie and pride, and using humour to make the best of their situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rose. That was uh, a fantastic talk. Uh, I'd like to now open up for questions. Again, if you do have a question, please come down to one of the microphones um, and speak into the microphone without touching the microphone. Um, and we'll also have questions, no doubt, from our webinar. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, what topic, like what did you find most interesting about your research topic? Wow, that's a really great question. There was so much. I suppose I came into it with very little knowledge of the military situation in Korea. I knew the basic outlines of the conflict, but I certainly didn't know much more than that. I think one of the most interesting resources that I was able to utilise for this project was a lot of oral histories. And I think being able to hear from people themselves how they found an experience, even if it's recorded a lot later, it really added a lot of depth to me. So I think just the details that they were able to provide, lots of the details that came out of um, my presentation were things that would never have been in official records or said anywhere else, but it was just you know, things that they remembered and that were important to them. So I think it was really those kind of sources that were able to shape how I saw the subject and really try and get a sort of holistic understanding of what it was actually like for them. So if anyone wants to go have a look, there are a lot of great oral histories online on the War Memorial website from the Korean War that are really, really worth listening to.
Hello, Rose. Um, Peter Stanley, UNSW Canberra. Um, I used to work here, and I was involved with the Summer Scholars Program from its inception for 20 odd years. And it's delighted to see, I'm delighted to see it's continuing and it's producing such accomplished presentations. So thank you. Um, you mentioned that um, Men of One RAR went back to Japan for arrest and recreation leave. Uh, Bikoff in Japan was notorious for its VD rates. Do you know anything of the effect yes. of? those recreation periods on the battalion strength and effectiveness? Yes, from what I understand, uh, with 1RIR it didn't have a huge impact. Um, it's a little bit hard because of the way that the records are. It doesn't always break it down to battalion level. Um, so I know that 3RIR had some problems with VD rates slightly earlier, um, but nothing that I came across suggested that it was a major problem that they were dealing with at the time. But I can imagine it would have undermined morale and things like that if people had been dropping out. And So I didn't come across any really obvious signs that that was a problem. Uh, thanks, Rose. I'm Frank Bongiorno from the ANU. Um, I wondered if you'd perhaps um, like to comment on the historiography and what you... I mean, obviously, yeah. as a part of this, you've... Um, mm. And you, you referred to some particular examples, including official history during your paper. Mm. I mean, what do you see as the, the main sort of strengths and weaknesses? I mean, you've obviously yeah. produced, I guess, very much a, a, a social history here of... Mm -hmm. of, of um, you know, of your topic. I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, where the, the kind of emph emphases and, and also gaps perhaps lie in the way yeah. that um, historians have discussed the Korean War. Yeah, absolutely. So I think in relation to 1RIR especially, so much of what was written about it really just briefly would mention that they were involved in Operations Blaze and Fauna and maybe lump them in when they were describing the conditions with the other units. So I think it made my job kind of easy because I was trying to focus on the specificity of one RIR's experience. So it was a real gap in the literature that I was able to feel and feel like I was making some kind of contribution. So that was a benefit for me, I guess, in terms of the historiography. But otherwise, obviously I've looked at quite a lot of things about the Korean War more generally. And I suppose quite a lot of it is quite operational or it's sort of basic descriptions of what the conditions were like without a real amount of depth to it or greater exploration of people's experiences. So I think, I suppose that's a reflection maybe of broader changes in the history discipline of, as it's sort of, operational details are still definitely necessary in military history, but it's sort of broadening out the discipline a bit to look at more angles of what the experience was like. and. Um, so hopefully my, my work is a bit of a contribution towards that. Thank you, Rose. Uh, that was great. Um, you mentioned that uh, the battalion virtually arrived together uh, mm -hmm. worked together, played together, and then went home together. Mm -hmm. I was wondering two things that you might have come across. One, uh, what the effect that had on morale uh, mm -hmm. while on the line, whilst uh, serving in Korea. And perhaps um, more importantly, did that work um, to mitigate the effects when they returned home mm -hmm. after discharge? Yeah. So firstly, on the morale point, I think it did have an impact in everything that I came across. That's one of the things that got me interested in this topic, actually, was that in the official history, in various oral histories and other accounts, a lot of them mentioned that morale was really high. Um, so I think that a big part of that would have been that they were together most of the time and that they were able to build those kind of strong friendships. So I think, I think it probably had some level of impact on, on morale. Um, in terms of when they came home, it actually is kind of interesting. In a lot of the accounts that I looked at and oral histories and so on, there wasn't really any mention at all of, of what happened when they got home, apart from their own individual experiences. But there wasn't a lot of descriptions of them having reunions or things like that or the general kind of community feeling, I suppose. Um, where, where I did come across those kind of accounts, it was more with individuals, like that they'd stayed friends with this person or this person. So it was a little bit hard for me to get a sense of, of that kind of 
community mindedness once they got home. So yeah, I'm afraid that's something I didn't really come across. All righty, thank you very much, Rose. Uh, let's all give Rose a round of applause. I'd like to ask Craig Tibbetts to come up and introduce Tim, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Craig Tibbetts. I'm one of the senior historians here at the Memorial. Uh, it's been my great pleasure uh, to supervise our second summer scholar, Tim Kem, along with my colleague Mel Hampton over the past six weeks. Tim completed his BA in Politics and Public Policy at Swinburne University uh, of Technology before going on to complete a graduate diploma in History at the University of Melbourne. He's currently undertaking a Master of Museum and Heritage Studies here in Canberra at the ANU. Tim has written about Australian rules football in Melbourne during the First World War and footy is clearly one of his great passions. He's a great fan of the Essendon Football Club and he misses being able to see them play in recent times. I learned about uh, Tim's footy colours early on uh, when, like any good Bombers fan, he scoffed at the Carlton emblem on my car. <laughs> no hard feelings, Tim. <laughs> But footy aside, uh, over the past six weeks, Tim has been looking at the papers of Major General Charles Rosenthal, those held here in the Research Centre and elsewhere, and put together an interesting assessment of him as a man and a soldier. So please welcome Tim to the stage. Uh, thank you, Craig, for those kind words, and I look forward to Essendon taking Carlton to school later this year. Uh, thanks also to Mel, uh, who was my other supervisor for this project, and thank you all for coming today. It was dark. He was tired and sore. By the time the weary traveller arrived at his accommodations for the night, he had already covered approximately 875 kilometres. On a bicycle, not by necessity, but by choice. It was late November 1898 when he embarked from the mining town of Coolgardie, Western Australia. A hot Australian summer was on its way and he was recovering from an acute bout of typhoid fever, having spent many weeks in hospital. Fortunately, it was just under 2,500 kilometres until he reached his destination. That night, he found refuge in the hut of a local family. The traveller, a keen musician, noticed that this family had in their possession a piano, which was sadly out of tune. Undeterred, the traveller took inventory of his supplies. There, alongside his meagre rations of food and water, he found it. His piano tuning gear, an utterly indispensable item for any cross-continental cycle. He was able to tune the family piano before hitting the road again on two wheels tuning many more out-of-sorts pianos along the way. The city of Melbourne was in his sights, where his wife was waiting for him. Only 2,472 kilometres to go. Our intrepid traveller was Charles Rosenthal, architect by day and musician by night. In 1898, he was tuning pianos in the Australian bush. But fast forward 20 years, and he would be Major General Charles Rosenthal of the 2nd Infantry Division commanding thousands of men as they charged up the hill at Mont Saint Quentin, capturing it from the hands of the Germans and achieving what some considered to be the single finest feat of the war. It is stories like this which evoke images of belligerent, blustering and, invariably, mustachioed men from the turn of the century. Rosenthal was certainly these things. Whilst his time spent as a full-time cyclist and part-time piano tuner makes for a remarkable story, it is only a small chapter in the life of Major General Charles Rosenthal. So who was he and where did he come from? Charles Rosenthal was born in 1875 in the town of Berrimer, New South Wales, to a Danish father and a Swedish mother. His military life began at age 17 when he joined the Geelong Battery of the Militia Garrison Artillery of Victoria. And his professional soldiering began in 1908 when he joined the Australian Field Artillery. 
Soon after war broke out in August 1914, Rosenthal was seconded to the Australian Imperial Force, appointed the rank of Major and put in command of the 3rd Field Artillery Brigade. He was soon promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and embarked on active service in September 1914. It was with this brigade that Rosenthal landed on the beaches of Gallipoli on April 25, 1915. He served on the Western Front as the commander of the 4th Division Ar Artillery, achieving the rank of Colonel and then Brigadier General. He was given command of the 9th Infantry Brigade in August 1917 and finally promoted to Major General and given command of the 2nd Division in May 1918. So let's take a close look at his CV. Aside from the Gallipoli landings, Rosenthal took part in such operations as Pozier, Mouquet Farm, the Somme and Third Ypres. As divisional commander, he was involved in the attacks on Hamel, Mont quentin the Hindenburg Line and Mont Brahain. He was wounded five times, mentioned in, in dispatches seven times, made a Knight Commander of the Bath and a Commandant of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. He was also awarded the Distinguished Service Order, the Belgian Cry de Guerre, the French Cry de Guerre, and a Légion d'Honneur. After the armistice, Rosenthal became commander of the AIF depots in the United Kingdom and was part of the demobilisation and repatriation of overseas forces back to Australia. His interwar years included the resumption of his architectural career, two stints in the New South Wales State Parliament, a term as president of the Australian, War Muse of the Australian Museum in Sydney, two stints as, com as commander of the Citizens Military Forces of the Second Division, and a declaration of bankruptcy during the Great Depression. There are also rumours that Rosenthal was head of the New South Wales branch of the Old Guard, a secret right-wing paramilitary organisation. He was appointed administrator of Norfolk Island in 1937 and remained in that position for the duration of the Second World War. He died in 1954, aged 79. So what kind of commander was he? Rosenthal was no chateau general. Later accounts described how he spent his time daring the Turk or the Bosch to drill holes in him, and that his continued existence was one of the strange manifestations of fate in the war. Indeed, he himself wondered if there were larger forces at work which were guaranteeing his safety. Rosenthal was first wounded at Gallipoli in May 1915, after a close encounter with a Turkish shell. This led to the conclusion that he was not destined to be killed by shrapnel. He later pondered in his diary whether the prayers of safety that he received in, in his letters were responsible for his lucky escape. He certainly conducted himself on the front lines like a man who was assured that he was protected by divine intervention. Danger was all in a day's business with Rosenthal, and later accounts recall that he encountered it equable and laughing. It is a risky style of leadership, and on occasion, Rosenthal would forget that the role of divisional commander held different responsibilities to that of the frontline soldier. Some of his actions could be considered irresponsible, if not downright reckless. One such example occurred on the 19th of July, 1918, when Rosenthal, as divisional commander, spent the morning examining enemy territory east of Vela Bretonneau. Charles Bean tells a story in his official history. Rosenthal was resplendent in red staff cap and gorget patches, Bean wrote, perhaps looking something like this. As the officers were about to return to their trenches, their patrol complete, Rosenthal was hit by a German sniper. His diary entry for that day records, records that the bullet shattered his right thumb and deflected into his forearm, severely lacerating nerves, flesh and artery, and making its exit on the, on the outer side of the forearm. Rosenthal was forced to return to England to receive treatment on his wound, and he would not resume his command until the 6th of August, only two days before the Allies launched the 100 Days Offensive, a succession of operations which would end the war. In his account, Bean was unimpressed and unsurprised by the whole affair. He thought old Rosenthal to be reckless in his actions and thoughtless in his choice of attire. Writing in his diary that when a digger spied Rosenthal in his crimson regimentals, he remarked, Struth Bill, there goes the bloody Salvation Army. Bean lamented Rosenthal's lack of caution too. Instead of creeping out and, laying, and lying on the parapet well back and taking a good, long, careful look, like a good soldier should, they were standing on the western end in full view. On top of this, Rosenthal had his steel helmet in his hand rather than on his head. However, it should be noted that as he was shot in the hand, maybe he had the right idea after all. 
Rosenthal was shot and, con and suffering a considerable loss of arterial blood. So of course the wise and sensible course of action was to retreat and seek proper medical attention. Instead, Rosenthal decided to rest where he was for a little time. It was only when German artillery began to land uncomfortably near that Rosenthal thought it best to postpone rest and make his way to the regimental aid post and have a medical officer properly dress his wound. Rosenthal, who now feared that he would be evacuated to England for further treatment, sought to be transferred to an Australian hospital in nearby Abbeville so he could remain close to the front lines. This cunning plan was foiled 10 days later when Surgeon General Neville Howes visited and declared that it was Rosenthal's duty to go at once back to England in order to receive the best treatment. This was the fifth time that Rosenthal was wounded during the course of the war. He would spend his time away from the front lines, eager to return to the battlefield. Not one to remain idle, Rosenthal would continue to receive official correspondence whilst in hospital and was kept informed on divisional matters. He later recalled that his primary concern was whether the wound would affect his playing of the piano, or perhaps his ability to tune one. I cannot find any record of Rosenthal getting reprimanded for his reckless behaviour from any of his military superiors. However, he was rebuked by none other than King George V, who remarked that he could not have his generals getting wounded this way when Rosenthal turned up in a sling to the knighting ceremony of General Monash. On another occasion, when Rosenthal was Brigadier General in command of the 9th Brigade, orders had come from divisional command that the capture of German prisoners was required. Rosenthal had insisted on going out with a small party to tape out new posts. Enter a party of six German soldiers. Rosenthal called on them to halt and drew his revolver. When they instead attempted a daring escape, he winged one German with his revolver and his colonel winged another. This was enough to encourage the surrender of the remaining four. The sight of a brigadier general returning from no man's land with his own party of prisoners was indeed an amusing sight for the troops. Colonel, Rosenthal said to, to the battalion commander upon return, if your men can't capture pris prisoners, just send down to brigade headquarters and we will. These are examples of the spirited frontline leadership of a commander who loved not only to be in the front line, but to be seen there. It was this style of leadership which endeared Rosenthal to the men under his command. Later accounts recall that before his men went anywhere into a sticky corner, Rosenthal went first. Of course, earning the popularity and respect of your charges alone is not enough to gain promotion in the AIF. You also have to impress those above you. Rosenthal excelled first as an artillery commander. He so impressed Lieutenant General Birdwood that by August 1917, Birdwood already had Rosenthal penciled in to command the next vacant infantry divisional position. But first, Rosenthal would need experience as a divisional commander. Thus, in August 1917, Rosenthal was given command of the 9th Infantry Brigade in Monash's 3rd Division. His predecessor, Brigadier General Alexander Jobson, had lost the confidence of Monash after the Battle of Messines and was perceived to be a leader who could not make up his mind and was pessimistic. Rosenthal was selected as his replacement and brought to the brigade, as described by Bean, a robustness and audacity intensely welcomed to its members. According to later sources, he was seen to be a decisive leader whose knockabout attitude and belligerence was like a fresh draft to a man thirsty for natural stimulant. According to Lieutenant Colonel Leslie Morshead, commander of the 33rd Battalion, there was all the difference in the world between Rosenthal and Jobson. Rosenthal is a man, Jobson had said. Morshead said, I should say. Bean noted in his diary that in 1917, the 9th Brigade was in poor shape. It was Rosenthal's task to turn the ninth around, and in this he was successful. His leadership infused a new life into the brigade. Reports emerged that the ninth under Rosenthal was beautifully turned out, and that their mere presence when they were sent to the Somme seemed to, as Monash put it, stiffen up the French soldiers that were already stationed there. Rosenthal soon proved himself to be a leader who was popular with the troops under his command. According to an unnamed digger, no head of the AIF was better liked. He was affectionately known as Rosie, always with respect. Much of his popularity can be attributed to his willingness to lead from the front line, as has already been discussed. But another crucial element was the responsibility he felt for the welfare of his men, and the effort he put into ensuring their comfort. Rosenthal was a commander who would undertake his frontline inspections on foot, often covering distances of up to 20 miles. He was always refusing the food and drink that were offered to him from his units because he did not want to take from the rations of his men. 
He was generous with praise and did not shirk away from attributing credit to his soldiers for the successes his command achieved on the battlefield. Rosenthal earned much acclaim from his superiors following the victory at Mont St. Quentin. But following the war, he was deliberate in directing praise to those who did the fighting. Mont St. Quentin was essentially a soldier's battle, he said, and his success was due very largely to the initiation, courage and skill of the individual soldier. Whilst Rosenthal was certainly popular, what was much more significant was his reputation as a physically large, strong, masculine leader who could act decisively when required. By the time he took over command of the 2nd Division in May 1918, the Germans were in the midst of their spring, offenses, of their spring offensive, their final push in the war. This would be followed by what was called peaceful penetration by the Allies, a series of small offences which, which chipped away at the German lines bit by bit. August 1918 marked the beginning of the Hundred Days Offensive, which ultimately led to armistice and Allied victory. Now a divisional commander, Hamel, Amiens, Mont St. Quentin, Peron, the Hindenburg Line and Montbrahain all lay in front of Rosenthal. Gallipoli, the Somme and Passchendaele had built Rosenthal's reputation as an able and formidable commander. Now, over the course of the next five months, he would demonstrate that he was also an educated soldier. A general who consulted widely, was well versed in the finer points of military operations, and who believed above all that preparation was the key to success. Alongside his desire to lead from the front lines, and what can sometimes be described as a disregard for his own personal safety, Rosenthal was a soldier who was educated in the finer points of military warfare. Reflecting on his time in the military, Rosenthal attributed his success to the fact that pre-war he would spend his Saturday afternoons, Sundays and weeknights studying British textbooks and practicing the lessons of war. For him, military examinations were easy stepping stones and he was well prepared when war broke out in 1914. Before the war, he would deliver military lectures on the development and potential uses of howitzer guns, citing its uses in battle as far back as the 15th century. Though he was known as an artillery man, Rosenthal was a student of many aspects of military operation and innovation. He studied aviation before the war and was of the belief that aeroplanes would add a new dimension to land warfare. He crash landed whilst learning to fly, but of course this did not deter him. He also kept extensive notes on the development and use of tanks, which first appeared on the battlefield in September 1916. His personal papers, now held here at the Australian War Memorial, contain hundreds of instructional documents, pamphlets and brochures, all providing Rosenthal with a template for how to conduct a war. These, docu these documents were considered important enough for Rosenthal to carry with him across the Western Front and back to Australia. He was also a man of transferable skills. An architect by trade, he designed his own dugouts and his were known to be the most up-to-date in the entire Army Corps. He even incorporated his love of music into his command. He believed that the best deeds of the war were done under the influence of music, that bands boosted morale, and that music helped restore the soldiers to a normal state of mind after the intense emotional strains of battle. He put this theory into practice when he was wounded at Gallipoli and entertained his fellow casualties on the hospital ship with a stirring rendition of Handel's Arm, Arm, Ye Brave. But like any other commander in this war, previous wars and every war since, Rosenthal was guilty of stuffing up. The most acute criticism came from Howard Edward Pompey Elliot. At the Battle of, Ma of Mont St. Quentin, Rosenthal's over-optimism, Elliot believed, resulted in the loss of many lives. Elliot accused Rosenthal of misleading Monash by exaggerating the extent of his troops' hold on the Mont. This prevented Elliot's artillery from firing, firing on the enemy because of the false belief that it was Rosenthal's men who held the Mont. Furthermore, according to Elliot, Rosenthal, Rosenthal ordered the 5th Division to advance over ground that he falsely claimed was clear. The 5th Division instead came under machine gun fire, resulting in a heavy casualty list and a great loss of morale. Soldiers were reported as saying that they would have torn to pieces those responsible for the attack if they could get their hands on them. Elliot's concluding remark was the kicker. A little more of that sort of thing and the men will lose all confidence in their leaders, he wrote. Elliot's harsh criticism of Rosenthal is unjustified. The war diaries of the brigade that suffered do not place any blame on Rosenthal for the attack, nor does the personal diary of the GOC James Campbell Stewart, who simply states that instead of Rosenthal's men holding the Mont, it was found in possession of the enemy. This mix-up can be contributed 
to the communication issues that plagued the attack on Mons and Quentin, rather than any attempt on Rosenthal's part to mislead General Monash. Elliot was known to have been bitter at his being passed over for divisional command, and the evidence suggests that his personal attack on Rosenthal is merely a case of sour grapes. But perhaps the most recurring, perhaps the most recurring criticism of Rosenthal's command is his tendency to be overly optimistic. Rosenthal has been described by Monash as an egregious optimist who was incapable of realising the possibility of failure. Whilst on the surface this may appear to be a virtue, such a quality in the, in the hands of a commander in charge of 15,000 men, it can be quite dangerous. Generals need to be acutely aware of the possibility of failure and its ramifications in order to temper the decisions that they make. Such was Rosen Rosenthal's belief in his own ability and durability any attempt by another officer to rein him in was met with disdain. On one occasion, when Rosenthal was doing something a, commander, a commanding officer definitely should not have been doing, entering no man's land on a scouting mission, he lost his bearings and began to make his way back to the Allied trenches. When a soldier informed him that that particular line of trenches was in fact occupied by the Germans, Rosenthal dismissed him. Nonsense, boy, he said. I was soldiering before you were born. A German flare then shot up in front of him, prompting a hasty reconsideration. On another occasion, when Rosenthal was again doing something a commanding officer def definitely should not be doing, entering no man's land on a scouting mission, he came upon a dead German soldier. When he turned on his torch in order to, uh, in order to identify the dead, ma the dead man, he was warned of the potential risk of illuminating oneself in the middle of no man's land. They can't see through me, was the general's laughing reply. This evidence is consistent with Monash's appraisal of Rosenthal, that he was incapable of realising the possibility of failure. Rosenthal perhaps failed to appreciate that as a senior commander, he was responsible not just for himself, but for the well-being of many. Furthermore, the ramifications of the death, or worse, capture, of a general would be seen to be severely detrimental to the war effort. Only five Australian generals died during or directly as a result of their service during the First World War. Rosenthal, the educated, belligerent opera singer of a soldier was perhaps lucky not to be the sixth. Thank you. Very well done, Tim. Do we have any questions at all? That was a remarkable story, remarkably well told. Thank you. Thank you. Throughout your examination of his life, are there characters that he looks up to for his leadership style, whether it's his civilian life or his military life, that he tries to emulate? Because uh, most good leaders will have someone that mentors them um, or multiple people throughout their career. So w were those people popping up in the things you looked at? Um, I suppose... The best example of someone he would have, he would have uh, looked up to and admired would have been uh, John Monash. He was quite close with Monash. Um, he would go holidaying with Monash, go climbing mountains with Monash. Um, he often spoke of how much he respected Monash's intelligence and abilities as a military commander um, in his diaries. Um, I didn't really come across anyone from like any historical military leaders who he might have looked up to. Um, that didn't come up in my research at all. Um, there were definitely some commanders that he respected more than others. Uh, and Monash seems to be someone who he, I wouldn't say he modelled his own um, commanding style off, but he definitely had a lot of respect for Monash. Thank, thanks, Tim. That was really good. Uh, it's Tim, Tim Roberts from Private Records Collection of the Memorial. So, so it's, it's really good to see the collection material being used in this kind of new, new way from some of some of the scholars' program. So my, my question is, uh, when, you, when, he was talking, when you were talking about how he present, liked to present himself as a leader, what did you come up... Was there anything in the Private Records Collection that indicated how he presented himself to to his wife as a leader when he was riding home compared to how he wanted to be seen by fellow leaders and was, was, was there a big difference between how he wanted his wife to see him as a leader compared to troops or 
fellow senior leaders? Uh, thanks for that question. Um, I actually didn't come across a lot of correspondence between Rosenthal and his wife. Um, the only one I did come across in the records here at the memorial um, was a Happy New Year's message. Um, the majority of his collection was based purely on military kind of papers um, and accounts of particular battles. So, yeah, I, it didn't really come up in my research about how he would have presented to his wife. Um, he seemed to, in the little correspondence that I did find between him and his wife, he was very formal towards her. He referred to her as Lady Rosenthal. Um, yeah, so there were actually a lot of personal papers that were potentially um, destroyed by Rosenthal, those more personal ones. Warren Perry uh, in 1969 wrote a brief biographical sketch of Rosenthal. It's the closest thing to a biography that we have of him. And I found in his papers correspondence between um, Perry and Rosenthal's son. Perry was after some of Rosenthal's personal papers and he was led to believe by his son that um, the majority of them had been destroyed. So whether that inc included more personal correspondence between Rosenthal and his wife, and I know that he did write to his wife quite often, um, it's either lost or I didn't come across it. I might just check at this point if there are any questions that have come in uh, from online viewers. Yes, uh, just the one question um, about his um, work. You mentioned that he was in the old guard and possibly hinted at having proto-fascist tendencies in the, in the years after the war. Did you have any comment on his career after his military work in the war? Uh, yeah, so um, there's speculation that Rosenthal was the basis of a character in a D.H. Lawrence book called Kangaroo. Uh, Benjamin Cooley was the character allegedly based on Rosenthal. Um, they have matching um, descriptions of appearance, um, characteristics, um, ex-military men. Um, so there is speculation that Rosenthal was quite a senior member of what was called uh, the Old Guard, which was um, very much right-wing, pro-military, um, white Australia, very much into British and Empire kind of stuff. Um, yeah, there are records of Old Guard, old guard um, kind of literature where they do indicate that they're kind of pro-fascist. Um, the extent of Rosenthal's um, contribution to that kind of thing, it's a bit hazy. His Warren Perry, his um, biographer, I suppose, um, looked into it. He didn't seem to think that there was much credence in it, but other people, um, Robert Derrick, wrote a couple of articles. Um, he seems pretty certain that um, Rosenthal was um, head of the New South Wales branch of the Old Guard. Um, he was definitely part of something called the King and Empire Alliance, which was a pro-King, pro-Empire, pro-White Australia kind of organisation. Um, and he was very much, very much against um, the Labor New South Wales Prime Minister Jack Lang at the time. And um, but whether he was, you know, part of this old guard and the extent of his um, uh, affiliation with this group. And their offshoot, which was the New Guard, which was much more um, belligerent and, and violent. Um, it's a lot of speculation at this stage. Question, Peter? Hello, Tim. Thanks very much for a, a great uh, picture of a, an interesting man. A man who, as you say, doesn't have a proper biography. Uh, could you describe the papers, and is there enough in those papers to be, be form the basis of a, a full biography, or would you think that it might be a better study to look at, say, Monash and his brigadiers uh, with an operational focus, because, as you say, he destroyed a lot of the stuff that uh, might lead us to the real man. What do you think? I think it would be difficult to construct a biography just from his personal papers. Um, I struggled to construct a 20 minute presentation from his personal papers. Um, a lot of it is, you know, pamphlets and brochures that were um, distributed from HQ. Very little of it is actually authored by Rosenthal. Um, but yeah, the fact that these papers exist is instructional, that he um, thought, them, thought them to be worthy and valuable of keeping. 
but if you wanted to paint a picture of of the of the man, um, I think the personal papers would definitely be valuable. But you're not going to be able to get a, much of his characteristics, much of his even his leadership style, just from his papers alone. Uh, just a supplementary. Um, as uh, Tom mentioned at the beginning, you were given this project. Uh, can I ask why? Um, I believe there was not much known about Rosenthal. Um, there was a bit of a gap in the um, MHS section's um, knowledge of him. Um, but he's a very interesting character, uh, um, at least I think he is. Um, also, he did keep an extensive diary throughout the war. He wrote in his diary nearly every day. Um, and I used a lot of that as the basis of my research. Um, that those diaries are kept at the Mitchell Library, of the State Library of New South Wales. Mm. Um, so it was possible to find out quite a lot on him um, and he pops up in a lot of um, a lot of Bean's official histories as well and a lot of the biographies that were done on other commanders. Great, thanks. Any further questions at all? No? Okay, well... Um, Please put your hands together again and thank uh, Tim Kim. Thank you very much, Tim and Rose. Those were two very um, interesting and engaging presentations and I think you've really done the military history section proud uh, this morning. Um, we're always very interested to see what you come up with um, each year. Um, to go to Peter's question uh, from earlier, both the projects are um, ones that were identified by MHS historians as being sort of gaps in our knowledge about um, uh, Rosenthal in this case or 1RAR in the, in the Korean War. Yeah. Well, that brings us to the end of uh, our presentations this morning. Thank you very much for coming along uh, and for supporting the, uh, the Summer Scholars. Um, can we put our hands together one more time for Tim and Rose? And I'd now like to ask our director, Matt Anderson, to present the certificates to our summer scholars. So we'll just play around with the lighting up here, turn the lights off, turn the lights on, all of that sort of stuff, and we shall present these certificates. Thanks, Craig. And while we get set up, if I can just thank, um, in particular, Craig and Tom for your supervision and Malaya for your supervision of uh, our two summer scholars for the work that goes into it, uh, for the care and the attention you give them and, and certainly to our two summer scholars, you know, to Rose and to Tim, thank you for that. I mean, I certainly as you're speaking about Rosie or Rosenthal, I was just imagining why, uh, you know, one of the divisional commanders in the Second World War, one of our five divisional commanders, certainly I'd heard about but I knew very, very little about and I, I wonder... Uh, you know, when you go back to Bean now, look at Bean in a different light to see where he pops up and in what, uh, you know, sort of lens uh, Bean decides to give him, just to give a sense again of how, you know, someone who was a significant Australian at a period of, uh, of great interest, certainly to this institution, uh, that we had a blind spot or at least there was, there, was, there was a lot more that needs to be discovered. I also understand when I met you guys, um, MHT, of course, refurbished the entire area just for you. So that's why it was painted and carpeted and, and set up. It was just an anticipation of our summer scholars. So uh, that's that's the heft you have around here. Um, but I just want to thank you for the way in which you've engaged with the memorial, engaged with our staff. Um, and we hope this is just the beginning of uh, um, you know a lifelong uh, passion for, for history and helping us uh, you know, turn a lens on ourselves as a nation through a detailed understanding of things that matter to us. I do want to acknowledge uh, Professor Stanley and Professor Bongiorno Peter, it's good to see you back and congratulations again. That's something that you uh, gave wings to all those years ago to see that it's still alive and flourishing. It should be uh, hopefully heartening to you and certainly of great value to us. So congratulations for your vision back then. Well done. 
And um, finally, I guess we get to do the, the handovers, but it is, um, it is a great pleasure to, uh, to acknowledge you formally, to thank you for you, the, you know, the work that you did, the insights that you've given us. You know, you've left a mark with us now because, again, you've, you've closed or partially addressed a, a, a gap of knowledge that we had and hopefully lit a candle for some other people to now use your research as the basis for further research because, you know, they're all stepping stones. We all build upon, uh, you know, the work of others and you've uh, uncovered a treasure trove uh, both in one RER and, of course, also on uh, uh, Rosenthal. And we thank you for that because uh, may other scholars follow in your footsteps and uh, provide further knowledge and insight such that we may learn. So thank you.